Congratulations to you, Shane. Oh, thank you so much, Chris, and, and happy Australia Day. And to you too. How special is this to you? Oh, it, it is very special, Chris, and, and I'm a very proud, unashamedly very proud Australian. I think we live in the best country in the world, uh, and we're the best country because of our people, before, because of our tenacity, our ingenu ingenuity, our, our ability to, to make the most of what we're dealt, um, uh, no matter who we are, uh, and to be, to be honoured uh, in Australia Day Honours uh, is, is wonderfully special for me. Uh, but, but I also reflect on this day and I reflect on this uh, wonderful accolade. Uh, I reflect on it with a bit of sweet. Uh, and as you just mentioned there, reflecting on that 2019-20 fire season particularly, uh, the enormous loss and the damage, uh, the destruction, uh, the tragedy and, and loss of life, uh, and in particular, uh, our firefighters, uh, our four volunteers, Jeff, Andrew, um, Sam and Cole, and then the three air crew. We marked the anniversary only on Sunday, yeah. Chris, uh, for the three air crew, Ian, Paul and Rick that crashed. So, But I also reflect on that season, picking up on the comments you were just having there with Bernard, uh, I reflect on enormous pride that I, was, that I was part of a team, that I was part of something where we saw the worst in, the worst in circumstances bring about the very best in our people. Of course, the volunteers and the, and the fire and emergency services but ordinary, everyday Australians, communities being impacted and devastated, we rallied together like we've never seen, and that Australian spirit really shone through. So, yes, I'm very proud, but I'm also very respectful and very mindful uh, of the enormous cost and the challenges that we've been living through uh, over the last couple of years particularly. I was on air every weeknight throughout that summer, and I was shocked at how endless these fire fronts were. And as I mentioned there ended up being 12,000 of them. Like, it's mind-boggling. How do you go about, when you're in charge of the Rural Fire Service, juggling so many parts of something that is so life-threatening? You're so right, Chris. Not only was there 12,000 fires uh, that season, but, but it was unprecedented in so many ways. It started very early on. You won't find me using the phrase Black Summer because I think it does a disservice to the people up north particularly, where we were averaging more than 1,000 fires a month during winter and then it just intensified as we moved into spring and summer. If you look back through history, uh, the decades past, you will find that our most intense period of fire seasons typically last a few days, maybe a couple of weeks. This season through 1920 went for 160 consecutive days mm. of high-intensity firefighting operations, extraordinary fire behaviour, uh, not just at 2, 3 and 4 in the afternoon, but at 2, 3 and 4 in the morning. Uh, and being part of a remarkable team, being surrounded by wonderful people, you put a lot of trust and a lot of faith in your investment, in your investment in training and equipment, systems and operations, and you, and you just focus on trying to support strategies and tactics with safety and saving of life first and foremost, and saving property and the environment and trying to get these fires under control. It was an awful period of time, Chris, but we all pulled together, uh, and in my view, uh, notwithstanding and not being insensitive or disrespectful to the damage and the loss, I genuinely um, um, hate to imagine uh, what it would have been like had we not been as advanced as we were and as organised as we were uh, learning the lessons of yesteryear. In a crisis like a bushfire or a pandemic, the public needs reassurance. You were so damn reassuring throughout that time, and yet behind the scenes, we know what was going on, not just logistical nightmares and, and the reality that there would be deaths with the next fire, but you also were prepared to give the Prime Minister and the Premier of the state a bit of a reality check along the way. Why was that important at those stages? Chris, I agree with you. I agree with your comments. I think, I think crisis leadership and leading through crisis, our principal objective is to build that trust and confidence. Trust and confidence in our teams, but trust and confidence in the community and the people being impacted and affected. And I think fundamentally at the core of that are a number of att attributes. But the first thing is authenticity, keeping things real. And that starts with the individual. Don't pretend or, or, or don't pretend to be something you're not. No one likes a poser, no one likes the imposter. And when it comes to the conditions, when it comes to the situation, uh, there's an old phrase we use in Australia, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with a dog poop sandwich, don't think you can cover it in hundreds and thousands and tell everybody it's fairy bread. You've got to be genuine. You've got to be real. If you want to bring people with you, if you want, to, if you want people to engage in the effort, 
make decisions and take actions that help improve the survivability of people, of communities, of infrastructure, then you've got to be honest. You've got to have honest, robust um, debates and messaging has got to be as clear as we possibly can. Yeah. Up front with what we know, what's happening and what we don't know. Up front with what we're doing and why we're doing that. Up front with what we can't do or won't be doing and why that's the case. And then most importantly, what do we want everybody else to do to be part of that equation, to be part of that puzzle to try and save and protect as many and as much as we possibly can. You talk about generosity, the volunteering spirit that we have in this country, which, of course, helped you and helped save lives, but also our resilience, Shane. You're now the Resilience Commissioner. Gee, we've got that in spades, have we not? Absolutely, Chris. I, I think we are far more resilient uh, as a nation than we give ourselves for. Volunteers are quintessentially Australian and... and, and, and Anything that you see operating or working well in your local community, I'm willing to bet with you it's underpinned by volunteers. Yeah. Whether it's in our education, supporting teachers and, and schools with all manner of things, whether it's in the sporting endeavours, weekend sports, adults, children alike, whether it's in healthcare, disability care, whether it's in environmental and, and land care organisations or, of course, our fire and emergency services. Without volunteers, we would be all very much the poorer as communities, as individuals, indeed yep. as a nation. So, so volunteerism, that sense of community, that sense of giving, that sense of belonging and being able to make a difference, yep. it's the critical thread that helps stitch us together. Yes, that thread can be frayed from time to time, but you know what? Someone will strengthen it up. Someone will, you know, redarm those, redarm those holes or those threads that are fraying away. And that's what volunteers do. That's what yep. community exactly. does. Exactly. And as exactly. I travel around, particularly my new role, resilience is tough. Resilience is about living through these, these life experiences, difficult, traumatic experiences, but coming out the other side, stronger, wiser, and learning from those experiences so that we're better prepared, we're better able uh, mentally and physically to, to anticipate, hopefully prevent or, or mitigate the, the next one, but yep. be ready for it to endure and come out well, the other side even wiser and stronger. Well said. I've got to go, but you, you've given us such precious time on a very busy day for you, and we're so happy for you and on behalf of you. Thank you so much, and uh, all the very best for the year ahead. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate it. Same to you.